I think the biggest challenge in the world right now, and I think the biggest form of oppression across the world, regardless of where you live, is patriarchy. And I like to um, paint a picture of patriarchy as an octopus. And patriarchy is the head of the octopus, and then the seven tentacles of the octopus, uh, the, the seven tentacles of, of the octopus are the various forms of oppression that patriarchy uses across the world. So there's one tentacle that is white supremacy or racism, another tentacle is capitalism, another tentacle is homophobia, transphobia, ableism, all of this. But the head of all of this is patriarchy. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you live. You can live in a democracy like Spain, you can live in an absolute monarchy like Saudi Arabia, you can live in China, where the Communist Party has been in power for almost 70 years, or you can be in the United States with a two-party system. Patriarchy is the form of oppression that straddles the entire world. I was born in Egypt and to a Muslim family and the Islam that we practice in Egypt is very different than the Islam we practice in Saudi Arabia. So I learned very early on when we moved to Saudi Arabia that there are many different kinds of Islam. There isn't one kind of Islam. And the Islam that was practiced in Saudi Arabia was a very conservative, very ultra-Orthodox kind of Islam um, that I was very unfamiliar with. So my parents met in medical school in Egypt and they married after they graduated and then we moved to London because they got a scholarship to get a PhD in medicine, they got a government scholarship. So I grew up in a home where my parents were equal to each other. They met in medical school, they got the same degrees, they both moved to London. But when we were in London, my teachers were always asking me, what does your father do? As if my mother just follows my father around. So I learned in the UK that very little is expected of Muslim women. And then when we moved to Saudi Arabia, I learned that there was a very different kind of Islam that then began to target especially women, like my mother, who couldn't drive in Saudi Arabia. She was driving in, in the UK, but she couldn't drive in, in Saudi Arabia. So I learned very quickly that the Islam in, in Saudi Arabia is a very, considers women the embodiment of sin. And I say that when we moved to Saudi Arabia, it was very difficult and it traumatized me into feminism. I, I think it's very, very important that Muslims around the world emphasize again and again that Saudi Arabia is not the representative of Islam, that Saudi Arabia is not the, the copyright or the, 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 the owner of Islam. And I think that um, one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest challenges in, in doing that is that the two holiest sites for us as Muslims are in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia acts like the de facto owner of Islam. And when, we, when my family still lived in Saudi Arabia, the then king, Fahad, took for himself the title, the custodian of the two, holy, the two holy sites or the two holy mosques, as if he owns and takes care of these. Nobody elected him to this position. No, the Muslims around the world didn't vote for him to be this. So it's very difficult to separate sometimes Saudi Arabia from Islam, but we must, because Saudi Arabia um, does a huge amount of damage to the image of Islam, and not just the image, Saudi Arabia, because of its oil wealth, has been instrumental in promoting a very conservative kind of Islam around the world. Um, the most fo extreme forms of Islam have been financed by Saudi Arabia, and they have led to some of the most violent expressions of Islam. When you look at violent extremist groups that are Muslim, many of them have either been inspired by Saudi Islam, or they've been financed by the Saudi regime. Well, I think that as Muslim women, especially in the so-called West, we are caught between a rock and a hard place. And the rock is um, the racist, Islamophobic right wing that wants to weaponize anything that a Muslim woman says to demonize all Muslim men. So they want to use my book, they want to use my activism to say, look, you see, even Muna, who is a Muslim and a feminist, says that, that this misogyny exists. And of course this misogyny exists because misogyny exists all over the world because as I said, patriarchy is universal. But this is the rock. The, the hard place is the Muslim community. And this is a Muslim community that wants to silence me and all other Muslim women who expose this misogyny because they want to do anything to defend Muslim men. And they tell me and they tell other Muslim women, shut up. Stop saying these things because you're giving weapons, you're giving ammunition to the right wing. So I have the right wing, the racists, the Islamophobes here, and I have the misogynists of the Muslim community here. And my message is, fuck you and fuck you. Well, I think that, you know, the whole issue of hijab and niqab and burqa and all of this is very complicating, is a very complicated issue. And, and I'm honestly 
fucking exhausted <laughs> from talking about the hijab and the veil. It, it's so exhausting. And so often, the only conversation that women of Muslim descent are allowed to have is the one about the hijab and the burqa and the niqab and over and over. And you know, and there are so many things that I want to talk about, but this is the one thing people always want to talk about. And also, my, my relationship with hijab and all forms of veils has developed, you know, because as I've become older, of course it's developed. I'm not stuck in an attitude that I used to have 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So when I was 16, I chose to wear hijab. I chose to wear hijab in a context that is very different than my context now. I chose to wear hijab in Saudi Arabia. And I explain why in my book, and I'm not going to get into detail now. And I wore hijab for nine years. But very soon after I began to wear hijab, I realized that it wasn't for me. And it was very difficult to take it off. I finally was able to choose to take off my hijab when I was 25. So I wore it for nine years, but eight of those years, I was struggling to take it off. So the way that I complicate the conversation about hijab is, it was much easier to choose to wear it than it was to choose to take it off. So my question to my fellow Muslims is, why is it easier to choose to wear it than it is to take it off? And this is how I want to complicate the conversation with hijab, regardless of where you live. Now, since then, I've taken various forms on niqab. I oppose the, the niqab unconditionally, regardless of where you live. And I support banning it everywhere, but I would never ally with the right-wing racist groups that push, including here, to ban the niqab because they are not my friends. And realizing along the way, as I developed my views on the hijab and the niqab, that it is often an entry point to a very racist and Islamophobic discussion, I now am on a position where I say, Unless you're a Muslim woman, I don't care what you think about hijab. That this conversation, if you, are, if you are not a Muslim woman, shut the fuck up. Well, you know, the revolutions that began with Tunisia in 2010 and continue to the, today, and now we've added Sudan and Algeria, I think that for, they obviously in, include men and women. But when we talk about feminism, when it comes to these revolutions, a lot of men I have found will say to me, ah, this is not the time. Come on, we're trying to get rid of these fascists. We're trying to liberate 60,000 political prisoners. We're trying to fix the environment, climate change, education, everything. They keep saying, wait, 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 this is not the time for feminism. And my response to them is, what you're talking about is a revolution against the state. Because of course, for you as a man, the state oppresses you. Of course it does. The state oppresses everyone. But what I want my brothers in the revolution to understand is that if the state oppresses men and women, the state and the street and the home together oppress women. And I call this, this triangle, the trifecta of oppression. And this is why I insist that without a revolution against this trifecta of oppression, our revolution against the state alone will fail. So I, I think the best way to answer can oppression be within religion um, as well as acted upon religion is to talk about um, Islamic feminism, which I, I don't identify as an Islamic feminist, but, but I talked about Musawa, this, this movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. So Musawa is like an umbrella and under the umbrella stands Islamic feminists like one of my heroes, the, the Muslim scholar Amina Wadud, and myself, who is a, a secular Muslim feminist. And I think it's, it's really important to have the two working in tandem because, um, for example, in 2005, Amina Wadud um, held a was the imam for a Friday prayer in New York City that was mixed gender. Now, in Islam, even though Islam does not expressly forbid women from leading prayer of men and women, it's, it's, nev it's never done. But Amina Wadud, who is a scholar of the religion, studied the religion and determined that as long as in, in, in Islam, as long as something isn't expressly forbidden, it is not forbidden, it, it, it's permitted. So Amina Wadud uh, was the Imam for a Friday prayer and behind her prayed 50 men and 50 women. And I was one of those 50 women. So before this prayer, some people wrote to us and said, show me in the religion where this is allowed. So Amina Wadud is a scholar of the religion and she sent them the Quranic verses and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad and all of this. I didn't want, I didn't need anything from the religion because I decided for myself that this is something that I wanted to be a part of. Now, when we held this Friday prayer, there were some protests in New York. A mosque would not allow the prayer to be, to happen in the mosque. An art gallery that wanted to, to host the prayer received a bomb threat, so they would not take us. So we ended up going somewhere else. But I was one of two women who prayed without a headscarf and I prayed on my period. 
And a lot, of women, a lot of people will say to me, how could you pray on your period? This isn't allowed. How could you pray without your headscarf? This isn't allowed. And I say to them, I gave myself permission because this is part of my revolution. So there is Amina Wadud, who is an Islamic feminist who reinterprets uh, the Quran and the sayings of Prophet Muhammad to give people a feminist interpretation of their religion. And here is me who has my own relationship with, with the religion because we are taught that no one is between us and God. So I think it's, um, even though I practice my, my feminism in a very secular way, I recognize the necessity of Islamic feminism because I want to fight patriarchy. And I will use any weapon in my disposal to fight patriarchy. For, for those women in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or in the US or in Spain, Muslim women, who want something Islamic, I say to them, read Amina Wadud. She will help you with the feminism inside the religion. Because my main goal is to fight patriarchy inside Islam and outside Islam.